I'm like being quiet. Like, Shh. Oh, no. Don't tell anyone. I'm not gonna tell anyone we're, we're drinking doing this on thing. the internet. <laughs> All right. Hi. Sandra from House of Funk, and it's Wednesday, which means we are getting over the hump with a little cocktail on Design Sips. Welcome. I have to pour everyone else a yeah, glass before cheers. I can do anything cheers like. Sorry. We have been a sweet bit, wee bit busy. I don't know, doing this little thing called launching the standard? Yes, and tell them, tell them what is dropping next week. The demo module. So what we did, and I'll, are you? No, okay. Team, let's cheers, and then let's talk. Yeah. To Wednesday. To so Wednesday. Cheers. <laughs> Kombucha lab. Cheers. Mmm. Nectar. It's nothing like the first sip that uh. touches your lips, people. <laughs> sweet nectar. Sweet nectar. <laughs> to keep going, sweet. Sweet nectar, OFS. You know I could make up some shit around that. Anyway, this is a Chardonnay, 2016, from the Russian River Valley. Diloch, Diloch. I don't know how you say it. Anyway, get some. This stuff is good. Yes. Is yes. this from one of our favorite wine stores? Do we know? No, your husband. Yes, your husband. Oh, oh box of wine store. Thank you, J. Arthur Levy. And yes, this is from Sharon over at. Oh. Um, I'm on, I'm on thank you. I knew you knew the name because it yeah. is always gone from my lips when I need it most. Anyway, thank you. This is a great one. So if you're local, you're local. Um, check this out at Amante Vino. Again, this is um, a Deloche, Deloche, Deloche Chardonnay. Yummy. Okay. Oh, we have awesome. a ton of designers joining us right now. Thank you, designers. I'm sorry for getting started a little late. We were in crazy, crazy marketing PR. Client, there's just been a lot going on this week, so I will do my not silent scream. We will drink wine together. So, okay, everyone get settled, get yourself a drink. Yeah, uh, kombucha loud. Yeah, okay. So, we were telling them what is coming next week their way, oh. what's dropping from the interior design standard. So, so that because we want you all to really fully understand just how crazy we're getting with the interior design standard, we are giving you a free demo module to just Wet your appetite for all that's to come. So that goes live in your pocket on February 26th. So we cannot wait to send that out to you all over the internet and give you a really good taste of what this whole thing's gonna look like. Yes, so yes. Clark and Co. Homes says loving everything you're putting out so far. Thank you so much. We Lots cannot wait for emojis. you to see the demo module. Can't yes. wait, can't wait. Yeah, so good. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, any other announcements we want to make before we dive into the topic? Um, we're announcing our bonus oh, uh, yeah, content. We're going to have some awesome guests. Yes, so, so please, list. if you're not on our email newsletter list, go to houseoffunk.com trade and get the newsletter. Get on the newsletter list. While we're here talking right now, drinking and filling out forms is definitely something you can do at the same time. I believe in you. Um, and that way, right after Design Sips, we will be sending out that email telling you exactly who and what is in our bonus modules. So the Interior Design Standard comes with so much more than every single thing that we could write down related to how I run my business. But in addition, we have four fabulous guests, um, guests who are our bonus modules. So, yes. And then at the end of next week, you Little are headed, for that. Um, out <laughs> west for DIC conference. Yes, so. and yeah, like major conversations about like what's the wardrobe, what's the plan, Nicole, what are we wearing? Mm -hmm. um, we are doing DIC again, which is the Design Influencers Conference, belovedly known as Dick, and um, we'll be there speaking. We are uh, return. I know it's a special place, Hump Day. I don't yeah. know what to tell you. <laughs> She's worked really hard today. She has worked hard. <laughs> Door clothes and the Baroque music on and my reading glasses. We're talking hard work people. Anyway, all right. Cheers. I don't know. I'll be at the DIC. We'll call it DIC if that makes you more comfortable. <laughs> don't give me an acronym and ask me not to say it. I'm just saying. <laughs> yes, cheers. Um, all right, so today we're talking pricing, but would love to hear from our designers because this is such a hot topic yes. conversation. DM us your specific questions. We're gonna give you or what comment. we think you I'm below. I'm so sorry. But yeah. we'll also be looking at our DMs. Yeah. <laughs> But, She's um, off the rails. Or email us. Or yeah, call our office. <laughs> <laughs> All forms of communication. Are going to be a big thing turns into a live call-in show, just like retro. Exactly. Oh, um, but we want to hear how they're charging, what their biggest okay. frustrations are, like comment all that info. So just, I should calm down and get yes. serious. This is a very serious topic. It is. I know. We get it. I know. 
I just am a little riled up. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> also, there's a cool question box at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. So hit the question box and see what happens. Oh. To our audience. Fancy. All, All right, right, cool. Are you guys um, also getting on the countdown for the standard? Don't miss it. Don't miss it. All right. Lead us over on you. Yes. So, yes. So, it, designers watching, please comment your questions, um, how you're charging, your biggest frustrations, any pricing questions you have. This is really our time to dig in together. Um, so, Sandra, this is such a big topic. And, um, you know, I... I would love to start with you sort of just sharing a little story about um, you've done it every which way and people always say charge what you're worth. Yes, so here's, exactly. Um, so here was the biggest kind of aha moment for me is I've been training with all these amazing mentors, I've been um, going to conferences, I've been listening to speakers and it seems like there's a, there's a natural excitement and encouragement of one another and it goes something like this charge what you're worth you know you're you should be making more money charge what you're worth but the part that I always left with when I was you know a young designer was oh, but what am I worth you know like how do I know what I'm worth that is so hard I mean we talk about self-worth all the time and self-confidence but then to put a number on your self-worth is insanely hard um, and I know how hard that is. And I think that it's like the example I always use, that artists typically will sell through a gallery. And I, I think, yes, that's marketing and that's connections, but it's also pricing. You know, it's like, how does an artist put together a beautiful painting and then know what to put, what number to put on that painting? That's often an outside counsel, right? That's often a gallery owner or an art person, there's a name for that, a curator or something, yes, um, who helps them price their art. But how do we price our art, right? Because yeah. I was just working on some content today um, and talking about interior design as a commodity. And a commodity is a good or service that is seen as relatively equal in the marketplace. So what that means is that every designer provides approximately the same value to a client. Well, that's just not true. That's like saying Picasso and my five-year-old, back in the day, were of the same value because they took the same amount of time on a painting. It's not a commodity. Interior design is as much, much closer to art than it is to flour or eggs, right? Um, it is not apples to apples across the industry. And so when we compete on price, we turn ourselves into a commodity. We become our hourly rate or our flat fee or the number that we attribute ourselves to and not the value of the art that we bring to the table. So uh, we talk about all the time that your portfolio is your best sales assistant because your art is your value. And so, you know, we'll talk about that as well in the standard about how to get photo worthy projects and I can give you my formula to make them photo worthy from the very beginning. Um, and how to position your fees around your true value, your art, the alchemy with which you put a room together and not um, belittle it down to an hourly rate and not belittle it down to the time spent on that art but rather the umame or the je ne sais quoi that is art. Cheers, ma'am. That's Amen. all I have to say. That's good. <laughs> Do we have some questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, oh, it's only us read the whole thing. Oh, okay. Hold on. Sorry, guys. Um, Clark, like the question like this. Homes. I design and build <laughs> custom homes and I'm expanding into offering whole house furnishings as part of our proposal. I'm imagining. Mm -hmm. um, hold on. Let's see. Just oh, it gets cut off. Yeah. Yeah, just bear with us one second, guys. We're just all right. accessing the Trying questions. to keep up with questions. I'm sorry, I went on a uh, no, no, not at all. So, so box moment. Um, all right. <laughs> Again, I was in some of this content today, so I was feeling it. Um, because so I do. Well, I go back to the questions we've had in the conversations yeah. with designers, and and it is sad to see. And and I get um, 
I get the democratization of design where, you know, design for, I want, I want to offer design for everyone and I want to bring it so that it's attainable, but it also, it, it can backfire. It can be a race to the bottom if we're all just competing on price. Yeah. And I do, I think like one of the things that's important with the standard is that you really have done it all. You've tried it every which way yes. and you've worked the system and you've refined and oh, tweaked. Right. Remember when that was the question that Ronnie asked me and I didn't talk about that at all? Okay. I always, I always, <laughs> she's like, reel it in, reel it in. Yes. So, so I can speak to that for sure. So I worked for multiple designers and also worked in the D and D, um, the design and decoration building in New York city as a salesperson while I was in design school at Parsons in New York city. And, by that, I found I really was exposed to all these different business models. It was a very high-end luxury showroom, and so we understood, just because we were in contact with designers, how different every one of them was doing it. This person would send their client to us, and we would we would include the markup in our price that we would show them, and then this other client knew the 510 code, and they were just going to help themselves to the net pricing, and like... Every, and one person said, oh, I just sell it to him at cost. I, you know, I charge this big design fee up front. So like we saw all of that at, and just how different everyone does it. It's confusing to the clients. It's confusing to the designers. It's confused who are trying to figure out the best structure. And it's certainly confusing to the trades who are trying to, you know, respect your privacy and your business model and how you do it. So, and then working in firms and then starting my own firm. I have personally done it every which way you could slice it. Um, I tried all of those different models that I was aware of and privy to. I bought the ASID um, design agreement pack way back when I was first setting up my first design agreement. And it had, I think, four or five different ways in that pack that you could structure your design agreement. So right out of the gate, I thought I was like, you know, making that big purchase, making that investment in myself and fast tracking ahead, I was left with more questions than answers because I had four or five different design agreements to choose from and I felt even more confused on which model's right for me and how do I know which model yeah. to use? There weren't any pointers as far as that was concerned. So I tried them all. Yeah. And I now have the data to back it up that I don't, I no longer subscribe to, well, we all do it different and that's okay. I now believe there is a best way. And that is what um, the standard is all about. It's, it's showing you a, the best way, the way that I do it now, which is proven, tracked, and guaranteed to work. Yeah. And you have a line that I love, which is like, it took you, you know, years in business to come to the structure that you love, but they shouldn't have to go through all of that struggle. And Exactly. You know. So my idea, you know, we talk about this all the time as well. I believe in abundance. I don't believe that sharing with you the shortcut to the best way, instead of you having to go through all the different iterations, I don't believe that that diminishes my light whatsoever. I, I personally truly believe that if all designers run a more efficient and profitable and joyful business, that the entire industry will become better at their job, they'll be better compensated, they'll be more respected, we'll be able to produce better interior design, we'll be able to increase our communication, we'll be able to increase our efficiency. I just think it's a win-win for the entire industry. Because I can be down here like just doing the best I can and kicking butt and taking names, but if my level of respect as an interior designer isn't as high as it should be as an industry because we have some, oh, everyone does it different and there's a lot of creatives out there that don't. I hear a lot from potential clients and from builders and from tra trades and vendors that I work with that it's just the wild west out there, that everyone does it so differently and it's confusing for everyone involved. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers to roping in that wild west. Um, okay, do you have Jeez. the questions loaded or what? So someone wrote, how do you communicate your worth to a potential client when there are other designers who charge less? That happens every day. Um, that That's one of the main issues, right? So I am constantly positioning my firm as art that is beyond the hours put into it. Um, that comes with time, experience, your natural eye. I will tell you again and again and again, your portfolio is everything. So put your effort into getting finished jobs that you can photograph. And then a big place to invest is photography. Um, we will go into how important it is to have a strong website, how important it is to um, 
to make sure that those photos are going out into the internet and linking you back to that strong website so that you can capture those potential clients that are interested in you. I find over and over again that when I have a potential client say to me, oh, I love that project with the kitchen with no upper cabinets, or oh, I love that um, peacock blue living room you did, I know that I have a true fan. Someone who knows my portfolio or quotes me to myself, that means it's my marketing is working because I am beyond a commodity. I am now, um, I am now art to them. I am now something that they aspire to have in their home. That is very, very different than I just need a designer to purchase the furniture on my behalf. I don't have time for that. That is not my client because I'm not competing on price and we are not just the service of bringing in furniture. I know that clients out there can get themselves a functioning home with furnishings and window treatments and area rugs and the right pots and pans in their kitchen, right? That's not me. We are the alchemy, the art, the whole setup. Of, we're the experience of interior design. And a big part of that is the processes and the standards behind it that take us from initial meeting to completed home with clear communication, timelines, investment estimates met, we're not, you know, we're, we're really pulling the entire thing through on a level of customer service that creates an experience that we, I mean, we are just knock on everything. We have this amazing core of clients that just keep coming back and keep coming back. Mm -hmm. And that's a testament to the procedures and the processes and the customer service yeah. that we provide. And we are. Cheers to my team. Cheers. Cheers. Yes. Cheers. Captain. 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 <laughs> um, we have so our questions, so hold on. Okay. Clark and Go Homes. I design and build custom homes and I'm expanding my proposal to include whole house furnishings. How can I determine a reasonable budget proportionate to the home cost? Yes. All right. So that is so important and so, um, so data driven, in my opinion, right? So what I did was I took 10 years of data. My, I'll back up real quick in case you don't know me. Finance degree, business process background. So I came into interior design as a numbers girl. So I was always keeping track of all my square feet, my per square foot cost, my per square foot design time. All of that data is there. I refer to it today to provide a flat fee for a, a, a design client. Um, so what I've done is I've gone back to that data and I've come up with my metrics and I can then take those metrics and project forward. So that is really the premise of the design standard is that we take that data and that principle and we set that all up for you and we give you literally my fee calculator and my design agreement so you can see how that data and how that design agreement dovetail together. We, we totally recognize that you are in a different part of the country with a different level of interior design and a different level of experience. So we also have done case studies to help each designer in no matter what region of the country they're in or how many years of experience they're, or what level of design they're doing, they can see themselves in those examples, those case studies, and they can figure out how to get into that place. Now we also are gonna teach you step by step how to go back to a past project and check those numbers. And you're gonna keep playing with that data until you can prove to yourself that it works. And then it's really easy to give yourself a raise, you just take it up, a dollar per square foot here and there as time goes on. So I will show you all of that. It's too complicated to talk about in design sips, but it is really the the basis of the interior design standard is this pricing model and all of these case studies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions that came in. Um, so we have a question, do you do 100% of your design fee up front or in stages? So I do 50% to kick off the project and I do the last 50% to confirm the first design presentation. What that does is it gets us rolling on that project and then it is, um, I'm paid in full for my creative, what is it called? Uh, intellectual, yeah, intellectual yeah. property. Yeah, I'm like, where it's gone. Yeah. I'm paid in full for my intellectual property before I give my intellectual property away, right? Because intellectual property is the design, the ideas, the thoughts. That's your brilliance. That's your art. That's the thing that cannot be quantified by an hourly rate. And once you give that away, you can never take it back. So it's just like a digital product. 
paid in full up before you deliver because it's really impossible to collect after the fact. Um, all right, we have another question from designer Donald who says, I just joined, um, may have missed your answer. However, how do you manage exceeding your time within your flat fee? So I, I work on averages generally. So what I do is I have, I'm looking back at historical data and I know on average how many hours I need per square foot on a job. And so that's the basis of my projections into my flat fee. Um, so I use that average. And so sometimes you're going to have a trickier client that's going to take you more time. And sometimes you're going to have a very, very, very decisive client that's going to take you less time. So you need to be able to roll with the averages. You cannot get obsessed with the one client that's taking more time. You need to continue to track your data. You need to continue to run your numbers. You need to continue to update where you sit. But you need to be able to roll with, it all comes out in the wash. It's like going to dinner with your best friend for 40 years. <laughs> Split the bill. Stop being a stickler. It'll all come out in the wash. Unless they always order steak and lobster and you don't drink wine and then you should talk. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't hanging out with your friends who don't drink wine. <laughs> no. And then the, the, they don't drink wine and they don't want to pay the bill. Send them home. Send what are they home? doing out to dinner right. with you? True. No. Just no. Um, one of our new awesome clients just joined, so glad to see you here and cheers to working together. Cheers oh, to working nice. together. So cheers. Excited. We are so thrilled. What an exciting day. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And thank you for your questions. We love them. Keep them coming. Indeed. Um, all right. I have another um, great talking point, Sandra, that you always talk about, which is why flat fee does work. Um, one of the starting points is that it, sound, it sets boundaries yes. with the round of revisions. Um, tell me about that. Yeah, so I, we talked about this before, but I'll say it again because I know live in, live uh, feeds are pop in, pop out. So flat fee works so well for me because number one, we discuss that fee up front, we talk about it once, we make a decision to move forward, and then it's over. <laughs> we don't spend the rest of this project billing, 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 billing. I have found that my clients would much prefer to have complete knowledge of what I'm going to cost up front, make a decision, yes or no, and then not keep talking about that every two weeks, which is how often I used to do time bills. Also, it allows me to give such better customer service to my clients. If I feel I need to stop in on site to check in on something, if I want to have three extra phone calls with the contractor, if I want to sample three more wall colors because I don't think we've quite nailed it, that's on me to go ahead and do. When I was running an hourly rate, I always felt like I was needing to ask, is that okay if we sample another? Is it okay if I check in? Or I was running up their bill unnecessarily. Now, I do it once, do it right, and I can provide that level of customer service. It also allows me to build a deeper relationship with my client. I'm not sitting there on the clock as I'm asking them, how was your week? How was your vacation? What's going on now? I hated feeling like they thought I was trying to run up a bill. And then the last one is, how we create boundaries is we're very clear on our scope, we're very clear on our process, we're very clear on our timeline, and we're very clear on how we handle revisions. So we include one round of revisions per design presentation. And what that means to me, one round, is that I will go back to the drawing board. If you need me to start over again, and I have done it back in the day when I didn't have my process locked down, <laughs> I have done it. Um, I will start over if I need to, but I need to do that in one round. So that means I give the clients a week in our schedule. If they need more time, they just need to then know that the whole schedule gets pushed out. One week to give me back their communication on what revisions they want to see. Once I have that, we go back in, we do our revisions and edits, and we have another presentation scheduled. It's typically two weeks after I get their input if we need more time because it's that you know, if the revisions are too large, we'll start to reschedule. But that really helps me understand that, it helps them understand that they don't have constraints on how many revisions, it's just one round of revisions. And it, I feel if I'm going back in to do revisions, it doesn't matter how many, I just really need to know the full picture of what needs to be revised from the very beginning. Okay, cool. That was yeah. a lot. But anyway, it's um, we have a couple more questions. Also, my friend Ashley from Oregon is watching. Hi, Ashley. Just Hello, Oregon. Here. Um, okay. Do you, and guys, a reminder that the question box next to the comment thing actually doesn't work. <laughs> it's 
cutting off your questions. Oh, they're you cutting see. off, so yeah. we can only see questions. So please questions. comment, comment them. Questions. Um, okay. I know pricing questions are often not super short, so yeah, yeah. go ahead and comment yeah. questions. Yeah. So who's so Danielle? Can you comment your question right now about the contractors? I'd love to see that, and and then who else is um, chatting us? Okay, Kate, comment, and then yeah, Danielle just had Danielle. A okay, so Danielle, comment your question. I get. Um, okay, hold on. All right, great. Well, while we're waiting for your questions to come up, um, we had another question um, a while back that I thought was interesting to address, which is a, someone asked us, um, I understand and believe, believe in flat fee, um, but I'm finding lots of potential clients that don't fit into this category. If someone, whether it's a friend or you know someone you don't know, calls with a smaller project, am I offering packages? So uh, I truly believe that if you feel compelled to do a job that's smaller than your normal, number one, be prepared to take a loss because the overhead involved in running a project, um, managing a new client, onboarding them, setting them up in your systems, getting everyone on board in your team, even if it's just a team of one, just that whole process has a certain amount of overhead to it. And so if you're going to take a project that's below your ideal project, which I'll help you determine and set in the standard, it just accept that it's going to be a loss. So that, you know, I joke with my family. This is my favorite line. I'm like, listen, if I'm in the will and I'm inheriting the house, free design. Let's do it. Like, <laughs> sign me up. Let's get that thing beautiful and at top yeah. value. If I'm not in the will, I need to treat you like I would treat every other client. I can't run my firm into the ground to help a cousin or to help a friend. I can't do it. And I would do it because luckily I'm blessed with a big family. Um, so my joke is like parents and siblings and maybe that one aunt, hey Sue, that um, <laughs> has me in here as a, uh, you know, on the list to inherit. Yeah, let's do this thing. Let's get that house top dollar. But everyone else, you really need to accept that you will take a loss on a job that is not outside of your, of your stated realm. Um, and the number two thing I can say to you is if you're going to do some half janky side hustle thing that is not up to your normal level, you will not... A, succeed in that project the way that you would if you do your full process, and B, you won't make money, and C, you're not getting any referrals or kudos off of that because it will not be your A game. So why are you doing it? If it's a gift, it's a gift. Take yeah. it as a write-off. Yeah. And so I just want to preface this next yeah. question. Um, a lot of this we're talking about inside the standard, but yeah. we'll read it to you. Um, do you have contracts with contractors? to do the work for the client or do they have their own contracts with the client? How do you handle that as far as liability and budget goes? Yep. So we do it both ways because there are times when we are hired after the contractor has been hired and there's times when we are hired before the contractor has been hired. And it's up to the client if they want us to run that project for them and be their one point of responsibility and communication, then we will put the contractor through us and we are insured to the hilt for that, and we have a trade agreement with those contractors so that we are completely clear that they work for us on behalf of a client, and then we take on the responsibility and the liability of all of that going through us. Some states don't allow that, so you need to talk to your individual lawyer. Um, if your state does allow for that, you need to then go talk to your insurance carrier before you start doing that. So I have both a um, wonderful insurance carrier and wonderful lawyer who have told me we are insured properly and we are um, have agreements in place to properly do that. So we do it both ways. Awesome. Good. And I will share, yeah, of course, those be more, templates. Yeah, in the right, the exact template for those, both of those relationships will be in the standard. So you'll be able to see how I do it. And instead of going to your lawyer with a blank request and a blank sheet of paper, which if you live in my area of the world means $4,000 in fees to get a full piece of paper back from them, um, I highly recommend taking to your lawyer instead a template that they can review and edit to your state's constraints. It is a whole different ball of wax. It's hours instead of days of work for your lawyer and um, will save you a ton of money. Cheers. Cheers to saving money. Cheers to, the, cheers to the, always having a template. You know me. I don't mm -hmm. do a blank page. Exactly. No blank pages around Blank pages here. scare the crap out of me. Okay. <laughs> um, 
All right, so another question is, um, Sandra, when determining what to price out for a project, how do you decide mm -hmm. which installed items are purchased through you and which ones are not? Hmm. So we identified that up front. And again, that comes down to the same question. Is there an architect, a builder already on the project? Am I the first man on the job and I'm bringing, I'm building it and bringing the team of the architect and the builder? So. You know, because there might be an architect who's bringing me in who already has preconceived ideas or a builder or what have you. So we will dovetail and figure that out, but that's something important to figure out from the very beginning when you're in pricing mode because you will be offsetting your design fees accordingly. So if you don't have the contractor going through you and you're not doing project management on this job, you will need to offset your design fee accordingly. So it's just, it's about knowing it up front and planning for it and budgeting for it because I'll budget either for the markup on that product because I'll be purchasing wholesale and turning around and selling it at reasonable retail pricing or I won't be getting a cut of that and I need to offset that a different way. Now if I'm not getting a cut and I'm not procuring it and I'm not following up on it and expediting it and tracking it, then of course I don't need to get a cut of that. Absolutely. Okay, we're kind of all over the place and we're covering everything. Yes. So sorry, I'm just going through and double Lots checking my notes. Um, tell me a little bit about your um, payment timeline. Oh, okay. So payment timeline, we really try to place payment in the appropriate location for our client's emotions, right? I always talk about my client's emotional timeline of a design project. It's like, yay, we're hiring a designer, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then we take all your money, trash your house, and it's a long time before we start putting it back together and making it gorgeous again. So, terrible idea to send clients time bills when they're down in the dregs of dirty house, already ordered all their stuff, and they're still getting this little drip, drip. It's like waterboarding your clients, sending them time bills while, they've, while you've gutted their home. So I do not recommend it. Instead, we do our flat design fee up front when their ex clients are excited about the project and we give enough breathing room between the design fee payment and purchasing so that they are separate cash flow wise and also separate as far as layering in all of those fees. We take 100% up front on product purchases with tax and freight included, 50% on labor or construction, and then that balance due is two weeks prior to scheduled completion of the job. Schedule completion, not actual completion, because we need time to process that payment, receive that payment in our bank account, turn around and cut those checks and get all of our vendors paid. That gives us time to do our punch list and get everything finalized and also wrap up the job succinctly without dangling payments due, which obviously can turn into a nightmare. I don't believe in AR. I have other things to do. Yep. I oh, know, that was good, man. You were like Cheers a that. one with that. I memorized that. <laughs> There's a script. <laughs> There's a script. It's There's a, a prompter. It's such a visual. There's no prompter. <laughs> this is all um, just off the top of my wine and juice head. Um, another designer asked what are your thoughts on flat fee and commissions, which kind of goes along with your business model and mm -hmm. maybe what you would say to a client if they ask. Yes. So the simple truth of it is our business is based on both a flat design fee up front and all purchasing and execution going through our firm. Memorize that. It is your keys to the castle. Yep. It's, as, it's literally as clean as that. That's it. It's the bottom line truth. Yeah. It's how we do it. It's our business model. Um, it's how we do it. It's a business. Um, um, so then yeah. Danielle also asked, will there be examples of trade agreements with contractors and the suggested agreement amount in the standard? Yes. All of it. Yes, we will have everything. exactly how I do it. And you, they'll all be editable documents. They are not PDFs that you have to sit down and retype and rethink. They will be PDF for pretty, but we'll also give you swipe files so you can take that content and you can put your details right into it. You can send it right off to your lawyer, make those edits and, um, adjust according to your local needs. She's in Jersey. Woo -hoo! Jersey, she's local. You local? Yeah. local? You local? <laughs> Cheers. Um, all right, another talking point. We talked a little bit about it earlier, but tell me why you um, call it the investment estimate instead oh, yeah. of the dirty word. I kind of regret <laughs> it, but not really. So instead of the word budget, we use the word furnishings investment estimate. That's not one word, that's yeah, three. Words. And they're not little ones. <laughs> but <laughs> on film days, I'm like, furnish. It's like, again, again. Um, F-I-E. F-I-E. That's right. 
So furnishings investment estimate instead of budget, and here's why. An investment estimate is an estimate of what they plan to invest in their home. It is, it is powerful, it is action, it is um, decisive, right? Budget is constraining, it's small, it's a big dirty word, right? I mean, when you hear budgets, budget cuts, we're over budget, like, it's all sorts of negative. And I wanna give positive flow to, this is a choice that they are making. This is 100% not an obligation. Do you want to invest money into your home to make your life better? Okay, that's your choice. The power is entirely in my client's hand to make an investment in the quality of their life. No constraints here. Damn, You're girl. so good today, man. <laughs> massively overheating. Do we have, like, is the heat on 80? <laughs> no? The AC um, is on. The AC is on. No, it's on. You can turn it down. No, no, no. And talk to me about how your investment estimate is based on historic averages and then showing your clients that in advance ensures that you're in the same stratosphere. Yes. So not only do we base our flat design fee off of historical data, I also base my historical investment estimate on historical data. So many words. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is, at the beginning of a project, I throw out average numbers that House of Fun clients in the past have spent on home on homes or rooms of my client size and furnishing level. That helps my client and I know if we are in the same stratosphere. I always joke, I could liken it to a sandbox. Are we do we belong in the same sandbox? Are you and I speaking the same language? investment wise, right? If I think it's going to take $50,000 to complete your room and you think it's going to take $5,000 to complete your room, don't you want to know that right at the beginning of the project? This would be terrible information to find out eight months in. When it's time to purchase, you've done so much design work, you've spent so much time and all of a sudden, like I found out, I had a sofa pitch that was too expensive for the client's taste, right? This, there is a better way, and I will show you exactly how and when to get buy-in from your client on how much they want to invest in their home, and to understand if that doesn't work for your business, then you must say, I'm sorry, this isn't the right fit. Thank you so much for reaching out. Like, you got to get a set of big girl panties, and you got to strap those things on, and you got to say, no, thank you, and it doesn't work for you. Unless you're in the will, and then you should just do it. <laughs> they will but follow the process if you do. <laughs> but follow, follow your process, process if you do. Otherwise, you'll, um, you'll screw that up. No, but I also love <laughs> with the, the investment estimate, I love that the client you know, works with you, and if they want to set a specific amount, and if that number falls below, yeah. then you guys work out and have it broken yes. into phases. Yes, and we do, so in the design agreement, we have um, a clause that says, if the investment estimate that you prefer falls more than 10 or 20 percent below, depending on if we're including um, hard surfaces or not. If that investment falls far enough below our averages that we need to make a call, I need to know, do you want me to design the best possible room and then we'll talk about how you're going to use your budget to execute that room, i.e. phases, or do you want me to absolutely design a space that hits that budget that feels complete? those are two very different things and I've learned over the years that assuming that they want to see the ultimate version of the room or they absolutely want to hit that budget is a terrible idea it will send you right back to the drawing board and that's never good mm -hmm. um, okay tell me if we have any questions coming in otherwise um, do you want to talk to me a little bit about freight and how you kind of address that yes and your pricing I totally want to talk about freight don't you so exciting. We should drink wine. Okay, so <laughs> freight. Um, another one of those annoying little things that was killing my vibes on the project. Like it was just leaving a terrible taste in my client's mouth. Yada, 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 design, 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 install, 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 massive freight bill, right? If you start getting into six figure projects, we are talking about five figure freight bills. If you are getting into seven figure projects, we are talking about six figure freight bills. This is not something you can mess around with. Freight is serious. So, 
You must state up front what it's going to cost. You can't hide that. I also recommend you state the tax up front when you're talking about five and six figure projects and seven figure projects. Just say it out loud. Just make sure it's okay. Give them a total or something they can total. I don't total things. Yeah. Okay, so these are not like little numbers, right? I have found that my freight ends up being around 15% of the total cost of the job. So I now build that in up front. And what that means is I am able to keep an eye on that. I track my data, I double check it, I make sure we're not over or below, like gas prices go through the roof, freight changes, right? So we're always kind of have a float. But I find that including freight up front in my 100% purchase amount, it's clear, it's concise, and it's so much better for everyone involved. As those freight bills trickle in, I offset them. Again, you must be one of those people that is happy to split the bill with your best friend that you're going to go to dinner with 500 times because it's, an, it's a game of averages. You, there will be times when you'll be over and there'll be times when you will be under. You must track all that data and watch the averages. This is important. So now I build in the freight at the beginning. I have... I. Freight comes in, we add that data, we pay those bills, and it's no drama. Do you know the best thing I do because of this? I finish the job with no invoice. There's not a design fee due, there's not a product mm -hmm. balance due, and there's no freight due. So not only am I giving them a completed finished home, because I will show you how to make it photo worthy from the beginning, I am also giving them no invoice at the end. They haven't seen an invoice for yeah. about a month when the job finishes if they have a contractor labor balance due. So talk about an elated, joyful state when their job finishes. This is the client that tells their friends. And that, my friends, equals referrals. Preach. Preach. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Tell me what you're drinking. Let's talk about that. Oh, oh. someone commented. Um, she didn't realize we had wine in the video. She's like, hold up. Wine what? Wednesday? She's like, we're drinking on board. It's hump day. Yeah, it's hump day. So why don't you tell them if they're new to our audience what, yes. where Design Sips kind of came about and why oh. they do Design Sips. What did, okay. So if you're new to this, um, Design Sips has been going on for how long? Oh, two on. years? Yeah, two. two years, yep. Okay, two years. And I remember when we first started this, it was literally mm -hmm. like, we should do video. We should do video. And I was like, uh-huh, yeah, sure. Uh-huh, yeah, we'll do video. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like, I yes my children. Like, mom, we should go ice skating with a broken ankle. Just saying. That happened yesterday. Um, and I was like, yep, yeah, uh-huh, yep, yeah, we should. Just yes in them and pretend like it wasn't happening. <laughs> and finally, Rania and Sarah in front of me, behind the camera, said, we are opening a bottle of wine on Wednesdays. We are plopping it down in front of you. We're going to roll tape and we're going to ask you design questions. And I was like, all right, if you ask me design questions, I feel like I could do that. Like, ask me anything. So originally we thought this was going to be full service client facing. They were going to fall at our feet because we were going to tell them what height to hang our, well, turns out it's you designers that were really tuning in because we're always looking for a way to talk to one another, talk business together, and basically drink on Wednesdays. Yeah. So that's so sorry. we've been going strong for a long time and I thank you for watching. Yes. Um, all right. So we have a, hold on, a couple more questions on the subject of photo worthy. Yes. Um, how do you handle situations with clients when they opt out of important pieces in the design that will um, sabotage the photo worthy results? So this happens. I know it's real. Um, I propose complete rooms, not individual items. So I try really hard to give proposals that are the entire space, art, accessories, throw pillows, and I will tell you again, I will pick out your teaspoons if you let me. So I really try, we really try to do complete spaces and we try, all of our positioning client facing is that it's a complete and total vision. The art is not separate of the, from the room. The, Pillows and accessories are certainly not separate from the room. They are the jewelry that makes the outfit, right? So explaining that from the very beginning, budgeting from investment, estimating that from the very beginning. <laughs> Good touch. <laughs> Dirty word. Um, all of this is about mindset. It's about I'm going to finish this project with a complete room. I am not going to finish this project with then art and accessories to complete. So that's number one. Number two, when the client just won't do it. They want to go find their own art. They are an art collector, which we love, and we absolutely value art collector clients, and we obviously don't want to fill their home with art that they have. You know, if they're really an art collector, 
yes, we have finally scored the Art Collector client. We do not want to take that away from them. Then we are, we are giving them ideal sizes. We are getting from them tone and look so that we can grow with them over time. We're creating more neutral spaces to be open to what comes. Um, and we are trying to help curate as they grow that collection. Our, our projects are 8 to 18 months and so naturally our client, if they are an art collector, will come into a few pieces while we're in the project. When art gets pulled, because art is so emotional. It and is. Art's the kind of thing that you know it when you don't like it, but you don't know what you want until you see it, right? So there have been times when instead of the never-ending cycle of showing someone art, you just decide this person needs black and white photography, and if that won't even work, then what we do is we bring in art for the photo shoot. Yeah. Say lovey. Of course it's for sale if they want to buy it. Once it's in the house, yeah, they usually like it. They do. I was going to say that's wow. a really good tactic to yeah. as well. So get with your local showroom, furniture store, art dealer, gallery, um, whatever it is. Make those relationships. Have accessories and art at your fingertips so that at the end of a job if you need to bring something in or even just want to add that last final layer go ahead and do that um we had another question how do you handle clients that take a long time to pay hmm. anyways to sort of this one is so easy with our structure if you don't pay we don't do anything and when you pay we jump into action it's like incredible it's like batteries to my little drummer boy. You put in the batteries and I start working away. You don't put in batteries, I'll find something else to do. You'll see, our payment structure is set up so that a payment kicks off action every single time. There's never a situation where I'm running around looking for a balance due. The only balance due that we have, right, is half of that construction budget. And it's funny, would I stop construction if I'm not paid? Yeah, I would because that's business. And while I love my clients and I build a relationship, that's business. So, yes. And trust me, back in the day when I didn't have this all locked down and I had a balance due on furnishings, which is why I never will again, I sat on the lift gate of a truck and waited for a check. Like me, the boys, the delivery men, we all just sat there. I was like, I'll take a check or we're rolling this truck out of here. A whole truck full of furniture. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you gotta be a business badass, people. True. Yep. Speaking of business status, we've gotten a couple of questions because I've, I've run through my questions, so I'm going to wrap with, we have a couple questions from our viewers asking, tell us a little bit more about the standard, what's included, what you might expect price-wise. Yes. Um, a lot of that is coming next week for them, but yes. tell us what you can now. All right. Sneak peek. If you're on live, um, the standard is $39.89 plus tax if it's applicable in your state. Um, and it is everything I could possibly write down on how I run my business. If, if it is a repeatable process or a document that we have drafted, I am giving it to you. It is seven modules. Um, I think our module list is coming out in an email shortly. Um, our, plus the four bonuses, plus my own personal bonus content to you. Um, I'm going to be available for three live VIP calls if you purchase in the first round when we open um, purchasing. Um, it is, honestly, I just want my entire industry to like take a big step up. So it is every single thing that I could possibly give you on how to run a rocking, joyful, and profitable interior design business. We are holding nothing back. Yeah. We, and we're giving templates that they can fill out. I mean, we're taking the guest files, out of the templates, PDFs, full everything, every, it's every contract my design fee calculator, it's every process, it's every email template, it's my entire potential client process, it's my entire project process, like it's my financial documents, it's my budgeting spreadsheet, it's every single thing that I have written down for you. Um, there is no follow-up product, there is no next layer, there is no upgrade. We are giving you the keys to the castle. There is one thing I still want to run a design firm. I still want to be present for my clients. So it is everything. There's nothing held back. Yeah. 
and it's cheers. coming very very soon it's coming very soon cheers to that and cheers to all of you guys thank you for your yes questions. thank you so much sorry for being so fired up today no keep my cheeks keep, 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 keep them coming <laughs> keep chatting with us yes please dm comment email call you can find us at houseoffunk.com slash trade i'm sandra funk this has been a fabulous wednesday of design sips see you soon cheers see you soon. cheers Crystal, the guy photographer who wanted to, um, he reached out once before he joined.